Ecclesiastes 7, 17. Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? Um, I, I find it very interesting the way that this is phrased here, um, as if being a little bit wicked is okay. But, but, but don't be overly wicked. Um, I, think, I think really what is being said here, though, is that everyone is wicked. In fact, in a couple of verses, he's going to say, in 20, he's going to say, there's not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. So all of us are, are going to, um, there's a certain amount of iniquity in all of us, but we really want to try to limit that. Um, do not be overly wicked nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? And we also know that that there's no correlation between being good and living long and being wicked and, and, and dying young because, because Solomon just said in verse 15, there is a man who perishes in his righteousness and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. So I think we have to understand this in the in the really in the larger context of of our relationship with God. Um, I think God does does give life and and joy and peace and eternal life to those who seek after Him and seek to do good. Those who are, as we studied a few weeks ago, those who um, are his own special people zealous for good works as opposed to those who are scoffers and unbelievers and, and, and deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think the second part of the, uh, of the verse is just a literal warning about killing yourself? Perhaps like a face value? Well, and, and Adon, that occurred to me. And what, what really occurred to me is, is that Brother David and I get to know a lot of men in jail who say that they're confident that had God not snatched them out of what they were in and set them in jail, they'd be dead by now. That that, that, that wicked lifestyle, that whole street lifestyle that they were used to um, leads to a lot of premature deaths. Um, they all, or most of them, have got brothers or cousins or nephews or neighbors or dear friends who have who have died young from overdoses or from being shot or from you know uh, taking their own life exactly. And so you have a lot of people not living out the days that God would have allowed them because of them being so immersed in that wicked lifestyle. And yes, that did occur to me and I do think that that's certainly a part of this cuz this is a broad statement. Do not be overly wicked nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? And that kind of and of course I don't know as much about society 3000 years ago, but today if you get into that if you get into that drug oriented, sex oriented, rock and roll oriented, I, you call it what you want, that street lifestyle, that's what the guys mostly call it, that street street life um, or that gangster life, uh, your chances of dying prematurely um, are dramatically increased. And, and why should you do that? It is good that you grasp this and also not remove your hand from the other from the flip side of that, from the side of being righteous and proper and good and seeking the Lord and trying to be um, acknowledging Him that He might direct your paths. For he who fears God will escape them all. And again, Solomon is not clearly not saying that if you fear God, you're guaranteed to live at least 80 years. But he's saying you will escape the the, the the premature death. You will escape the the punishment, the wrath. Ultimately, you'll escape hell. Um, for though, for he who fears God will escape them all. The fear of God will keep us from will keep us out of that lifestyle. The fear of God will make us humble. 
the fear of God will cause us to seek Him and to try and live in accordance with His Word and the, and the roles for us and the lifestyle for us that He has prescribed. And all things being equal, that will lead to a longer, more prosperous life. It just will. When we take care of ourselves, when we live a healthy lifestyle, when we live um, in harmony with our neighbors, when we do good, when we let God direct our paths, um, we will have a, a longer and a more prosperous and a more joyful and a more peaceful life. He who fears God will escape them all. And that's a theme that we're going to see several times here throughout Ecclesiastes. Ultimately, even though life's not fair, life's not fair, all is vanity, all is vanity, he who fears God is the one who, at the end of the day, um, will be victorious. Verse 19, here we sort of have a standalone proverb. Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten rulers of the city. Um, and and, and I, I, I hear again, he's talked about so many times the same thing happens to the fool. It happens to the wise person. Sometimes fools prosper and wise people don't. But um, if you had the choice between wisdom and, uh, and having a lot of guns and horses and chariots or whatever it is, um, wisdom... Brother David, you're a military man. Wisdom wins a whole lot more battles than having more guns than the enemy has. Verse 20, For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Uh, that's a pretty broad statement, and, and it is the Word of God. And it's um, interesting to me how often... Uh, and Brother David and I hear this in jail, and we hear it in church sometimes. People who have convinced themselves that man is inherently good. We're inherently good. Um, when in fact the Bible says just the opposite, that we are, that we are, with our free will, as soon as we have the opportunity to sin, as soon as we have the opportunity to rebel, whether you think of a two-year-old or whether you think of somebody being six or seven or eight and having that and, and being told right from wrong and choosing wrong, every, there are no exceptions. Every one of us is going to rebel. Every one of us is going to, to choose to sin. Um, yeah, yeah. If everybody's saying not to do this, there's got to be a reason. I want to find out what it is. Um, I tell the men in jail all the time, okay, guys, you know, you're talking about how desperate you are for your sons to grow up and not turn out like you did. Okay? But think about this. If you if you, if you got a 10-year-old son and you're saying, son, if I ever catch you smoking, I am going to beat you into next week. And you never smoke, they never see you smoke, and, and you don't smoke, and they know you don't smoke. Versus, son, I, if I ever catch you smoking, I'm going to beat you. In a, and they know that as soon as they go to bed, you're out on the back porch lighting what, one up. What are they going to want to do? The absolute, the first opportunity they get, they're going to want to do what dad does. And especially with children. But I, but I, but I would, I would, I don't say argue, but I would suggest and we're going to read something else here in just a moment it, and it's not just a matter of the it's just not a matter of there are some people who sin once and say huh I didn't like that I think all of us have a rebellious streak in us um, and and I think that's you know that's God gives us life and gives us that free will that comes with the rebellious streak so that we have to willfully make the decision that no, I am going to receive the faith that God will give me and I'm going to, I am going to make a concerted effort 
to go against my own nature, to bury that old man, to let that new man live, and, and not, to, not to be a willful sinner. This is Romans 3, um, 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb, with their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison is of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is none righteous, no, not one. We have, we, we have no righteousness in and of ourselves. That's, that is stated so bluntly and so clearly. And so I don't know where this, well, it comes from people who just simply don't read the Bible or maybe their mother told them something or maybe they found a church that teaches that, that people really are inherently good and we just fall into the world and start copying the world and then we have to get corrected. No, the fact is that we start out what did David say? I was born in sin. Um, and God gives us the opportunity to recognize that and acknowledge that, to receive the gift of faith that he wants to give us and to receive the Holy Spirit that he wants to give us, to, to see our sin for what it is and to turn from it. What does it say over in uh, in, in Corinthians? Corinthians 10:13 says for we are subject to no sin aside from that which is common to man no temptation aside from that which is common to mankind and God is faithful and good and with every temptation will provide a means of escape we don't have to sin we do sin but but the fact is that and if we're filled with the Spirit, the more we're led by the Spirit. In fact, Galatians 5.16 says, If you are led by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. To the extent we let the, the Spirit direct our paths, we don't sin. Verse 21. I really, I, I really like this passage because I can relate to it so much. Also, do not take to heart everything people say lest you hear your servant cursing you. For many times also your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. There's a really deep principle here that we all need to, all need to take to heart. It is the word of God, of course. Um, and I think this applies to more than just, you know, what people say. Uh, and the fact is that I like to think that, you know, as a, fairly mature Christian. I don't gossip, but certainly there was a period in my time, a period of, in my life when I did. Um, you know, when I said oh, horrible things about other people, I'm sure other people have said horrible things about me um, based on some of the gestures I see out on the road. People are thinking horrible things about me. Um, uh, But we, we, just, we just need to not take everything everybody says so personal. Um, so often, Brother David often says, hurt people, hurt people. And so oftentimes in the jail, for example, somebody will come in and they're just, they're, and they're so upset and they're so hurt and they're so angry that they're just, they're just, they're just lashing out never seen me before but you know um, I represent authority I represent the outside I represent you know um, so, sometimes I even represent uh, uh, law enforcement how that happens I don't know but you know I'm not wearing the clothes with the stripes on them and therefore I'm an object of not only can I not take that personally but I really need to realize that I'm in a position 
to be an encourager. I'm in a position to bless. I'm in a position to be the one that listens and then tries to respond with words that, that edify and encourage and bring hope. Um, and, and I think about, to me, this applies, this applies to traffic. Uh, 812 is notorious, as, as everybody knows. There's a, a community about halfway between here and Austin, and there's a lot of people in that community. Um, and they've learned that if they don't insert themselves into traffic, they may sit in an intersection for a long time before they can get out on 812 and get on their way to work. Um, but other times, you know, it's the middle of the day, I'm the only one on the road, there's no one behind me as far as the eye can see, and somebody will pull up and they'll wait till I'm right on top of me, on top of them, and then they'll pull out, and I'll literally, I'll have to slam on the brakes, and then they'll eventually get up to 20 miles an hour, and, and then they'll turn, and then they'll turn a block later, or two later. And, and for a long time, that would really, really, really upset me. And then, I find, then it occurred to me, it occurred to me that that could be my mom. And I would not want somebody thinking about my mom what I was just thinking about that person in that, in that car, okay? And I also, sometimes, and sometimes it's teenagers, sometimes it's kids, it's teenagers, it's just people that are just oblivious. And I have to remember that when I was a young driver, I was oblivious. If I needed to get somewhere, it was like whatever I can do to get somewhere. And if somebody has to hit their brakes, that's okay. That's what they put brakes on cars for. I was that person. And that's what this is saying. Rem always remember... When you look at somebody else and you don't like what they're saying, you don't like how they're driving, you don't like it, that at some point in your life, that's been you. That's been you. Now, maybe that doesn't apply to adultery or murder or some other thing, but the fact is, you know, he's talking about do not take to heart everything you hear somebody say. Don't take everything personally. That person that pulled out in front of me, and they didn't know it was me. They didn't wait and say, oh, whoa, that's Hollingsworth coming. Ah, you know, it wouldn't have mattered who it was. It's nothing personal. That's just the way they dr drive. Um, maybe they didn't see me. Maybe, they, uh, maybe they're not paying attention. Maybe they're on the phone. Maybe they're texting. Maybe it's my mom. You know, so um, again, it, we need to be careful not to take other people's actions personally. And you reminded me of another aspect of this. Um, Y'all know that, like it or not, um, I'm a landlord. Like it or not, I don't like it. Um, uh, well, we have a little RV park, for example, and we've got we've got three or four mobile homes that um, that somehow somehow we ended up with, and and. And some t and tenants are humans. I mean, tenants are humans, and most of them, like most of the world, is just, are they of the world. Uh, most of them will take advantage to every extent they possibly can, um, and it's nothing personal. But, but, you know, when somebody punches a hole in a wall, or when somebody doesn't pay the rent, and then they text my wife and they say. Oh, I had a flat tire and I had to spend the rent money on the tire. I'll try to get you paid off in a couple of weeks. And, you know, that's never good. That is never a good, none of that. And, and Rahana gets, she gets worked up about it. And I said, whoa, whoa, sweetheart, sweetheart, are you letting, are you letting so-and-so steal your joy? They are, they have a problem. They are making poor choices and you're letting that steal your joy? And she's like, oh, well, yeah, I am. And that doesn't sound like it's very smart, does it? Well, no, because your you're joy stealing, you're, you're having your joy steal, stolen, isn't fixing the hole in the wall, isn't paying the rent, isn't changing. It, it doesn't matter how upset you get, you're not going to change them. You are not going to change them. And, and the other thing, the other thing that, it, that we should be reminded of is that if we want to be forgiven our sins, we have to forgive the sins of others. If I want to be forgiven for every stupid thing I've said about somebody, I need to forgive anyone who's ever said something stupid about me. Verse 4. 
verse 23, all this I have proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. As for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? Um, this, is, this topic has come up several times in, Ecclesi in Ecclesiastes already. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into it. I'll remind us of what David says in Psalm 131. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Um, I, I think the less that we get wrapped around the axle trying to understand things that God has just simply not given to us to understand, and the more, more we focus on the things we do understand, which is that Jesus Christ hung on the cross in atonement for my sins and for the sins of every single person who will receive him and accept him and confess him and stay. Um, what does Jesus say? The one who endures to the end and who will endure gets to go to heaven and spend an eternity in a glory and a joy that can't, can't be imagined. Um, had another had another evening Tuesday in the Caldwell County Jail where the guys immediately jumped off into into perceived um, problems with the with the justice system and and one guy in particular was so distraught and and he really had no right to be distraught but he was not in a frame of mind where I where I could just say uh, brother you have no right to be distraught so let him vent everybody kind of calmed down and, and, and then finally I said guys please understand I really really do care about what you're going through I really do and I really do care about what's going to happen when you come to court next week or next month or next year I really do care about where you're going to be next week and next month but I care a whole lot more about where you're going to be a thousand years from now and that changed the entire room. Every, every man in that room said, yes, yes, Ted, you're right. Yes, Ted, you're right. We need to get off of this, and we need to, we need to spend this evening in the Word of God while we're together while, and have that opportunity. But there are things we just are not ever going to understand, and uh, people devote their lives to trying to understand things that God has not given us to understand. And I think we're wise when we recognize that and don't and don't don't spend too much of our time and energy on those things. Verse twenty five, I applied my heart to know, to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even the foolishness and madness. He uh, said this earlier on, this very, very same thing. I've applied myself to understand folly, to understand madness, to understand righteousness, to understand all of human motions and all. I've applied myself to that. Uh, and then he ultimately says, he ultimately says, uh, he ultimately says, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Um, it's, it's a dead end, trying to understand things that God has simply not given us to understand. And then he says, and I, I've struggled with whether or not this is a sequitur or a non sequitur, but then he says, and I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be trapped by her. And I, and I think the connection between foolishness and folly and wisdom and women is that is that if we are not if we are being led by the flesh we will be attracted to attributes in women that are not in our long term best interest we just put it like that if we are being led by the spirit Will we be attracted by women who, I mean, if we end up in a long term, if we end up in a marital relationship, are in our best interest and in the best interest of our, of our home? Um, when we're being led by the flesh, we look for women who are good looking. We look for women who are sexy. We look for women, uh, I'm not going to get too detailed there, but 
we know what men look for in women um, if you're if you're looking with the eyes of your flesh that's where that word epithumia lust comes from with the eyes of our flesh if we're if we're filled with the spirit and we're looking for the woman that God would have us look for she's going to be gentle a gentle sweet spirit she's going to raise the moral and ethical bar in our home she's going to hold us accountable um, she's going to be a partner she's going to be a spiritual partner um, and she's going to encourage and edify us and she's going to allow herself to be encouraged and edified by us she's going to assume the role that God assigned for women in the home and in the church um, she's not going to be loud and boisterous and and she's not going to try and take over um, and I'm not saying that, that that'll never come out in, in, a, in a woman, but I'm saying that the, the qualities we look for if we're wise are going to be very different than if we're, just, if we're just looking with our flesh. Here is what I have found, says the preacher, adding one thing to the other to find out the reason, which my soul still seeks but I cannot find. One man among a thousand I have found, but a woman among all these I have not found. So he's saying that men that are upright, men that truly, truly are seeking the truth and are seeking to be, in our case, Christ-like, men that are truly, truly hungering and thirsting for righteousness and, and willing to pay the price for it are very, 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 very few and far between. He's saying he's never met a woman like that. And remember, this is... This is uh, this is the man who had what, 600 wives? Let's see, I think it's 1 Kings 11 that gives us the, the, uh, the sordid details here. First, is it 1 Kings? Yeah, but King Solomon loved many, many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, Hittites, nations from whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they shall turn your hearts after other gods. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. So in all of the, among all those women, <laughs> um, For all of Solomon's wisdom, I kind of have to conclude that he blew it on that one. That because of his wealth, because of his power, because of who he was, and because of his because of his wisdom, um, and again, just because of the sheer power that he had as the king over Israel, um, he was in a position to have whatever he wanted. And when it came to women, he let his flesh be his guide as opposed to the spirit. Um, clearly there are women who are truly, truly virtuous. It is interesting if you know Proverbs, the 31st, the 30, 31st chapter of Proverbs. Um, I'm not going to play Bible scholar here, but I think Solomon did not have access to the 31st, what we know as the 31st chapter of, Sol of, 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 of the Psalms, I mean, of the Proverbs, um, written by the mother of King Lemuel, right? Lemuel was not a Hebrew king. He, uh, in fact, there's absolutely no historical record whatsoever. He's not in any of the genealogies of the kings of Judah or of Israel. He's just not there. He's not a Jewish king. Um, but what he wrote, what his mother told him, what he, wrote, what he wrote, God felt like was wise enough that he wanted it in his, in his word. He wanted us to have it and to have access to it. But clearly, clearly we see that there are women, and I think we just know from our own experience that there are women who are virtuous and who do fear the Lord and who do seek after the Lord and who are a true, true asset to their husbands and to their families and to their churches and to their communities. 
Apparently Solomon didn't know any of them, but they do exist. Truly this only have I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. So it's not clear whether, whether Solomon is saying that little teeny tiny babies when they're born they start out innocent and immediately you know they start wanting things their own way because they have free will and they're flesh and blood or if he's talking about Adam God created Adam and intended Adam to stay away from that tree and to live forever in the Garden of Eden it doesn't say but either way it makes no difference it, it doesn't matter it, it doesn't matter if we believe that the day we were born we were innocent because in very short order, we stop being innocent. We're not innocent. And um, we're all guilty. We all fall short of the glory of God. And unless we accept and receive the gift of grace, the gift of, of atonement for our sins that Jesus Christ alone accomplished on the cross, we will die in our sins and be separated from God forever.